Sandstorms and volcanic eruptions, titans of nature with an impressive ability to produce lightning, and they owe that electrical prowess to the tiniest of things, trillions of grains of sand. I have been fascinated by sandstorms and dust devils for as long as I can remember because they're a force to be reckoned with. Even on the smaller scale, a bucket of sand and a vacuum can produce tens of thousands of volts. So after quite the bean water fueled bender, I felt compelled to answer the age old question. What exactly is stopping us from bottling a sandstorm? This video and my privacy are sponsored by Incogni. Honestly, this uh, sand and vacuum thing was an accidental discovery of mine when I was shooting my last video. While removing sand around the fulgurite, I was greeted with sparks racing up and down the hose towards my hand and several painful shocks. Naturally, I enjoyed the shocks because I'm weird like that, but it did get me thinking about the science behind it all. When sand grains are rubbed together, they experience charge separation. Some of them become negatively charged and some turn positive. If there's enough sand engaged in this duel to the death, really high voltages can be produced. This is how dust storms and volcanic clouds create lightning. So I thought, why not upscale this cute little vacuum trick? Can it even be upscaled? After blank stares into the distance while contemplating the engineering required, I had an idea. Ultimately, what I settled on was something between a bad idea and a weather machine. I planned to cage a dust devil. I know, famous last words. It seemed simple enough. <laughs> on paper. I'd build a vortex chamber filled with sand. This meant a large glass tube and a base that blows air spinning upward. Some kind of a top that allows air out but not sand. Yeah, and a capacitor plate at both ends. Chaos in a bottle, able to produce electrical discharges. Now, finding giant glass tubes isn't exactly easy. Anything over a couple inches, <laughs> good luck. Luckily, Pegasus Glass in Canada came in clutch with a 12 inch wide, 4 foot tall tube ready within weeks, so I ordered that. Next up was to design the base, which would be tricky. Using Onshape, I tried a few design iterations and settled on connecting the tube to the top and bottom simply using a pressure fit. I'll leave a link down below so you can try out Onshape for free yourself. Now, after it was all sketched up, I realized, uh, ah, the model geometry would be really difficult to print correctly, especially the top. Luckily, I have a friend who knows a thing or two about 3D printing, so I paid him a visit. This is the bat cave of my friend Joel, who is 3D printing nerd. When I pitched him the project, he was happy to not only help with the printing, but also film a video of his own on the printing, and he'll have that video up on his channel. So my pipe dream with the venting was it would be good to have like a little angle here, like like a camera shutter, yeah. and change the angling. So rather than building in the angling here, you make this all one part that we is easy to cut, and it's just a generic air chamber. Joel proposed several design changes, which ultimately helped this project so much. Okay, so Joel's going to be taking care of the top and bottom, which is whew, a huge convenience. And while he's doing that, I want to talk about a huge inconvenience. <sighs> Scammers and spammers. Look, in 2024 alone, over $17 billion was stolen from U.S. citizens. And this is in part due to data brokers. Data brokers are companies that gather personal information about people, such as phone numbers, addresses, and social security numbers, then sell it for profit. Because of this, you'll get spam calls, lose control over your personal information, your location safety, and even experience identity theft. Even worse, the data brokers periodically get hacked, so then your personal information can be used to take out loans in your name, like what happened right here. The United States is way too lenient on these crimes, so we kind of have to protect ourselves, and that means one of two things. Either you live out in the forest like a hobbit, or you get a protective service like Incogni, which I've been using, and it's incredibly simple. Incogni reaches out to data brokers on your behalf, requests that they remove your personal data, and handles any objections automatically from over 230 brokers. They also keep your data off the market by doing repeated removals. It's super easy to use. First, create an account, and second, allow Incogni the right to work for you. You can then sit back, relax, and watch them work. Setup takes maybe a minute, and they've got a few plan options ranging from standard all the way to family unlimited. Give it a stab and take back your personal data using Incogni. Go to incogni.com slash plasma or click the link down below and use code plasma to get 60% off an annual plan. Right, so in a few days, Joel had the parts printed up and delivered to my location. <laughs> that is way bigger than I anticipated. 
As I unwrapped all of Joel's prints, it finally started to hit me that this was a massive build, maybe the biggest one this channel's ever seen. And Joel did something really smart when these were printed. He added snap fit joints, which allowed me to simply pop them into place. Never heard of that feature before, but it made a world of difference when it came to saving time. Both the top of the project and the base were held together firmly this way. As planned, the top slid right into place, so I moved on to creating an electrical ground for this vortex. It was a bit tricky, but ultimately it came together with few issues. Base complete, which is the hardest part, so now on to the top. Similar to the base, I trimmed a metal plate to fit the underside of the top. This would act as either a positive or negative plate compared to neutral ground, with the hopes that rising particles in the chamber would collide with it, allowing charge accumulation like one plate of a capacitor. And the next morning, my glass tube arrived, making my neighbors really curious. I told them it was a cannon. At this point, they really expect no less from me. Assembly was easier than story time in first grade, leaving really only one last part, and that part was even more crucial than I first realized. So massive cylinder needs massive air, and I think this pump will probably do the trick. After printing a really poorly designed funnel, it was go time. So before I turn on this thing for the first time, I, I want to talk about this interesting top design. It's essentially my attempt at a centrifugal air filter, Right, there's going to be a dust devil inside of here shooting air and sand out the top. So I needed something, some attempt at a design that would let the air out, but would recapture the sand and deposit it back into the tube. And what you see here, this dome, is an adjustable air outlet. So right now it's at maximum air out, and now that's at minimum air out. So I can adjust this kind of in situ. For this first test, I'm going to use styrofoam peanuts so I can trace the airflow and uh, see what type of vortex forms. Let's give it a try. Yes, come on. Oh, no, okay. Thinking the top was the issue, I opened it up to full. Well, clearly my design wasn't going to cut it. I, um, I haven't exactly studied fluid dynamics, and I think the test made that pretty clear. The first design was too constrictive to incoming air, so I focused on a more open design. This one had an offset input with four supports angled at 20 degrees to encourage inward rotation. After an SOS to Joel, he had the new designs printed up and shipped out next day. After a snap fit and some gloop, the base assembly was pretty much complete. So I think this new design is going to kick some ass. You can see it's open concept, right? So there's no structures in here to obstruct the airflow, less air resistance. And also the input is about 50% wider than the first uh, design. So all around, way less resistance. And I think this is going to work great. Base, blower, borosilicate glass, plus a new air funnel that didn't suck, and some peanuts. So, with the output set for maximum airflow, and then with the increased airflow from the new base, creating a vortex should be child's play. Child's play. Come on, baby. Let's see it. Yes! <laughs> Massive improvement. What a shocker that not blocking airflow leads to more airflow. Still wasn't a vortex though, so I got to work printing a giant cone. This would be installed in the base and help direct airflow upwards through the glass chamber. Powering up the fan, this seemed to have an impact as seen by how rapidly the peanuts rose, but still no vortex. So back to Onshape and a third base design, this time with symmetrical dual inputs and a cone that curves gently upwards. From what I read, these changes would make a world of difference. I was feeling really confident about this one, so much so that I skipped the styrofoam peanuts and the sand and moved on to something much more potent. 7,500 nylon balls and 7,500 polyethylene balls. When they rub together, they form a triboelectric pair, creating really potent static. And to help make those collisions happen, an open top. This coming test didn't exactly go according to plan, not uh, to plan at all actually, but the results, uh, they changed everything. Within seconds of spinning up this Beijing cocktail, it was clear it wouldn't form a vortex, but I could feel a static charge building and building quickly. 
hair on my arm actually started to stand up. It was really hard to film, but this part, well, it filmed itself. Not static where I wanted, but static nonetheless. And this made me realize something. I've been going about this entirely in the wrong way, but now I know what I have to do. While the initial goal was to create a proper vortex in the tube and hope for static charge separation within the vortex, I now saw a better pathway. With the PE ball spinning inside the tube and the tube being made of glass, they create a very strong triboelectric pair. Glass being positive, PE negative, meaning force the balls to rub as hard as possible on the glass surface, create a lot of static. Now the current blowers weren't cutting it, so I needed something with a bit more volume and speed like a leaf blower. Better yet, two of them. With two, I can have leaf blower races. After yet another redesign of the base which pointed air upward at 18 degrees, I assembled the parts, held my breath, and waited. I was feeling much stronger static fields this time, strong enough to, to finally show this. My hair standing up with every rotation of the beads. Oh, that's way more than last time. Ooh. Oh, hello. <laughs> that test, ah, that was the confirmation I needed. More speed, more collisions, more static. I mean, the hair on my arm was standing up from about a foot away, and that neat little pointing trick, well, that was cool. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below if you think you know what was causing that. But here's the deal, the balls weren't even spun halfway up the tube yet, so naturally that means the next step was... Even more air from the most powerful leaf blowers I could find anywhere. They might as well have been handheld jet turbines. This metal ball, for example, weighs half a pound. <laughs> With both of these, I can now pump 30 cubic feet of air per second into the tube at 150 miles an hour. Okay, new blowers, new base, and new hopes. This represented a radical shift in how I thought this build would go, but there's no denying that this is incredibly beautiful. Running the test again, the static field was strong enough to suspend a quarter pound of plastic beads oh, two feet up. It's even better. I continued these tests late into the night, experimenting with configurations, air temperature, and humidity. And really no shocker that heating up the incoming air improves performance further because hot, dry air helps keep surface static charges in place. So after running a bunch of tests late last night, I realized that one of the limiting variables that I haven't really experimented with yet is the actual number and supply of polyethylene balls. So here is another 4,000. <laughs> that is half the tube. Wow. That's a lot of built up charge. And I have an idea on how to extract it. This is a conductive cage, which I spent way too long building. It slides right over the outside of the glass and inductively picks up a static charge. The top and bottom toroids are connected by copper tubing and all surfaces are curved, allowing a maximum charge of 100 kilovolts. Hopeful as ever, I turned on the afterburners and waited for glory. The balls appeared to be locked within the vertical limit of the cage, which was really interesting, and using my static detector from a few videos back, I was able to see a strong static charge developing, at least once the power was turned off. Though, as you can see, the charge dissipates quickly. Let's give it a try. I can feel a little bit of a static field. Oh, come on. That's nothing. Well, that didn't exactly go according to plan. Um, the Faraday cage style electrode was supposed to inductively pick up a charge from the static electric fields on the glass and then kind of store a charge itself like a capacitor. Didn't end up doing that. Instead, it just killed the entire performance. Not sure why. Um, so I need to try something else. So picking up a charge inductively clearly didn't work, but what about using direct contact with the outside of the glass, which should be negatively charged. Uh, foil makes maximum contact, so it should have a good chance of transferring charge and accumulating it. All right, let's see what this one does. Oh! Oh, I felt a really strong static charge. Come on, man! <laughs> 
After a few more attempts, I was able to pull about a one centimeter spark, but that was about it. I repeated those tests at least a dozen times. I even included a central electrode mounted on a metal rod that goes up to a collecting sphere. And I, I tried smooth electrodes, I tried pointed electrodes, I tried electrodes on the inside and the outside. No matter what I did, anything I added to the setup detracted from the static charge generation. Mm. I do have a few more ideas which could extract that static in a meaningful way, but for the time being, I think we have our answer. The thing that is stopping us from bottling a sandstorm and creating insane static charge is nothing. However, actually extracting that static is going to take a much better design. Massive thank you to Joel for his assistance on the first two designs. I'll link his channel down below. Thank you to Gloop for being awesome and to my friend Pooch for supplying a nearly unlimited supply of 3D printer filament, which I very much needed. This video took an insane amount of work and I'm not done yet. So most importantly, thank you very much for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below and you stay classy.